I'm John. I'm going to tell you about uh, my, my green life. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, why I do it, so how I do it, and why I do it. And uh, even though the news is bad, I'm going to continue doing it. So I'm hoping that that one will do it. OK, so the how and why of my award-winning low-carbon lifestyle. Um, I'm really here because I got quite well known because um, in 2008, I won the Oxfam Carbon Footprint Competition with the lowest carbon footprint in the UK. Well, thank you, but there was only 100 people took part. So I probably didn't have the lowest carbon footprint in the UK, but the lowest of the people who took part. And my carbon footprint was then a twelfth of the UK average. So um, I didn't do this overnight. Um, this, is, this is me on my allotment that I then had a few years ago. And um, I just want to go through a bit about the history of, of how I arrived at the low carbon footprint. I was a kind of a nature boy. I was a bit hyperactive and liked playing in the garden as a child. And then in the... Uh, 80s, I kept lots of animals and insects, and I pinned insects. I was really into nature in that way. And in the late 80s, I had a, a very profound and deep experience that made me feel connected with nature in a very special way. Um, and so I started living a green lifestyle as a young, young adult. Uh, it's my walnuts. Um, so I got into environmental activism, and I got involved in things like Local Agenda 21, the local exchange trading system, I helped start a credit union. Um, I got politically active. I was involved in, still am involved in the Green Party. I did a green degree and uh, I started a family. And uh, the one thing I didn't realise about my carbon footprint was my sons. They're, they're now teenagers, this is a few years ago. So I didn't actually consider the carbon footprint of having children. But that's, that's by the by. What actually happened was by having children, I think I started taking things more personally. In fact, I wasn't talking about your grandchildren's grandchildren. I was talking about my own grandchildren's grandchildren. So let's go on about how to be green. Um, you, can, you can measure being green with the amount of carbon that you emit. But it's not the only thing. There's a lot of things to do with uh, social justice, inequality. But I'm, I'm going to do the shorthand by looking at your carbon footprint as the real um, way that this touches the planet. Your carbon footprint is made up of your uh, transport choices, your food choices, the um, energy, and energy that you use in your home for electricity or power and heating, the stuff you buy, and then there are um, the, the, thing, the things of your carbon footprint that you have no control over that the government does on your behalf. Things like road building, uh, the military, schools, that kind of thing. So um, this, is the average, this is how the UK carbon footprint breaks down. And um, I think the, the next slide is how I deal with transport. I'm a very keen cyclist. So transport's been easy for me. I learned to ride a bike in 1971, and I've been riding a bike every day since. I went on holidays with my bike as a teenager, lots of long holidays, and I moved house with, bike, with my bike and trailer in 2001. Um, I've... I've got a driving licence, I got that when I was doing my degree in the mid-90s, but I've chosen not to be a driver because it doesn't fit with my green ideals. Um, I have um, given up flying. I gave up flying in 1997 because flying is one of the biggest ways that you can trash the planet. So um, I use public transport. So yesterday I did, I'm, I'm an entertainer by the way, and I did a kids entertainment party in Chalton in Manchester yesterday. I cycled to York Station, took a train to Manchester, got a tram to Stretford and walked a mile to Chalton. That is the life of a green entertainer with my unicycles and bag of juggling kit. The next bit of your carbon footprint I also found very easy. Um, I turned vegetarian in, when I was 20 and now I eat a lot of fruit and veg, and I forage, and I pick my own. These are some foraged cherries off a tree. I don't know whether they're cherries or what, but they're a nice sweet fruit that I made a pie out of or something. Um, and uh, I also pick things from neighbours' gardens. So there's a group in York that I help run called Abundance, and these pears and apples were picked uh, from a tree near me, and they came home in the bike trailer, and they were then I had some of them myself, and I just helped distribute them with Abundance, to people who need that kind of thing. 
Um, and I like growing my own food as well, so there's a nice courgette. Um, so that's, that's the food and my... Oh yes, I'm a freegan as well. Um, I, I get food out of bins. I'm, I'm very lucky that I'm, I'm not afraid of bins. And you lot throw away a load of stuff that I then eat. Um, so um, that, that's kind of a, a good way to keep your carbon footprint down, to waste less and to use other people's waste. Now, my, how I run the home is we, have, uh, we heat with a clear view stove. In fact, two smoke-free wood stoves. They're fantastic. They kick out a lot of heat. They burn wood in such a way as they don't produce any smoke. And this is the uh, rather untidy back room. Uh, it, you can see the stove has got a kettle on it and some other saucepans. And balanced on top of the saucepans is some waste fruit that came out of a bin that is drying. So I make my own dried fruit. Uh, I, we heat bath water and washing up water on this as well. And the idea of this is it replaces fossil fuel use with renewable. And it's actually waste wood. So here's some uh, logs I brought home, uh, just dumped by a tree surgeon and I'm very happy to make use of those. I dry them for a year and then put them on my stove. Um, I do love the, the creative uh, side of um, building a, a, pretty, a very pretty log pile. Uh, we get the home electricity from Good Energy. They uh, sell 100% green electricity, renewable electricity. And uh, I don't actually, produce, don't actually get all the uh, all the electricity in the house from Good Energy. I actually produce some of our own and uh, we sell some back to them. And uh, the other panels you'll see in the top of the photo, they're hot water panels. So we get some of the hot water on a sunny day through, through those. And uh, we do actually have a small gas bill, which is quite a major part of my carbon footprint because gas is a fossil fuel and I use gas, but not very much. So... Um, the other important thing is how we use energy. So although the electricity in the house is 100% renewable, I still like to use as little as possible. So I have um, A-rated fridge and freezer and washing machine, double A-rated even. We changed all the light bulbs long ago from incandescents to uh, CFLs, the compact, compact fluorescents. And now as those are going, um, we're replacing them with uh, LEDs, which are very, very eco-friendly. They use a very small amount of electricity. We switch things off at the wall. Um, we put lids on saucepans when we cook, because that means that you're wasting less of the heat. We use a microwave oven instead of using the main gas cooker. Um, and the other thing is I don't have many gadgets. There's not many things on charge. I don't have lots of things plugged in. I live quite a simple life with my electronics. I have a very nice laptop and that's about it. Um, there is a fairly big hidden, hidden carbon cost in our life, uh, which is water. Water is very heavy and it needs a lot of pumping. And so your water footprint is an important part of being green and being sustainable. Uh, I use a toilet like anybody else, but in our house we only flush when necessary. But on a nice summer day, I use this toilet. Now, some of you might recognise Justin Rowlett, the ethical man from Newsnight. Uh, he came and did a, uh, a thing on being ethical, and he's sitting on my compost toilet. Uh, and uh, that, that, was, that was great fun teaching him all about uh, that aspect of composting. Um, I'm also keen to reduce landfill waste. And one of the best ways you can reduce landfill waste is with composting. So here's a wormery uh, with various uh, bits of plant and animal matter. There's some hair in there from a hairbrush. Um, and uh, that we, what we do is in the kitchen, we put all the food waste in uh, cereal boxes and then they just go in the wormery like that and they rot down to make something like that. And then that can be used to grow that ni nice courgette. Uh, you don't have to have a wormery. If you've got the space, you can have a compost bin. And that's a, a compost bin. Everything's held together with cardboard and, and chicken wire and I've just taken the front off. And then when you dig it out, that's the type of material you get from it. Lovely, rich soil. And you can riddle it to make it into fine, rich soil as well. So I, I do love my compost. Um, there are one or two things which I do which are carbon negative, maybe. Um, I do composting for other people. So when somebody hasn't got a compost 
a place to have a compost bin, then what I do is I'll say, I'll have your food waste and I compost it for them. Uh, another thing I do is I make biochar. Now, biochar is a type of uh, charcoal which you can make in your wood stove very easily. And what it does is it takes woody material, and I use sawdust off my log pile, and it makes it into a solid carbon material which you can put in your soil or in your compost and that sequesters carbon out of the air. So uh, not only am I trying not to emit very much carbon, but I'm actually taking carbon out of the air and um, putting it into the soil where it will last for thousands of years. I'm quite a keen recycler with traditional recycles. So there's glass bottles and jars, uh, steel cans, plastic bottles, uh, shiny paper. All the, all the um, newspaper and cardboard in the house gets composted. Uh, drinks cartons get cycled down to Hazel Court. Um, I pick up aluminium cans off the street and also I'm a bit of a skip diver and this is one of the best things I get out of skips, that's copper wire. Uh, electricians quite often throw away little lengths of copper wire and I collect them up and twice a year I go to the metal merchant and I get a little check or straight into the bank account with my copper. Now I live like this because I want to be a positive impact on the planet. Or maybe I want to be a bit less of a negative impact. I don't know which, which way to look at it. But it, there's a good feel-good factor in being green. I mean, when I started being green in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, people thought I was a, a kind of a weird hippie. And, and now people think I'm a great guy. What a lovely introduction I got about, you know, how great I was. And there's, there's been a big, big turnaround in those 30 years. Um, in, in this country, uh, we have an absolutely massive carbon footprint. Um, the, the carbon footprint, oh, okay, I've, I've overdone that one. The carbon footprint uh, has, of, of, the, of, of the world's population has caused the carbon um, concentration to go up uh, from 280 parts per million, which is the pre-industrial 1700 figure right up to over 400 today. So that's pre-industrial to today. And if you want to look at the carbon, carbon uh, concentration over the past 800,000 years, that's what it is. The, um, you can see right on the right-hand side of the graph, uh, that's where we are now at over 400 parts per million. All the dips are where there were um, glacial periods and all the high points are interglacials. So we've had eight glacial periods over the past 800,000 years. You might want to call them ice ages, but we're actually in an ice age all the way through that. Um, and interglacials are really comfortable to live in, and there's a close correlation between temperature and CO2 concentration. So you can see right on the right of the graph, there's that line going up to 400 parts per million. Where do you think the temperature is going? So the next few graphs I'm going to whip through really quickly because they're an indication of where we're going. Okay, this is These are where I see, this, this is what kind of, um, how can I say, this is, this, this, in, this is the information I get about where we're at. Population, uh, the population has just skyrocketed. This is um, a, a, big, a big issue. Um, this is ocean acidification. As the atmospheric carbon dioxide has gone up, the uh, oceans have got more acid, and that will make it very difficult for uh, shelled creatures and corals to continue, and that's where a lot of the marine life comes from. Um, methane has shot up over 150% since the Industrial Revolution, since we started burning coal and opening up uh, coal mines and uh, farming in the way we do. And methane is a massive, massive greenhouse gas, really, really important. We've lost a lot of forest. This is a cartogram of forest loss. Uh, we've lost forest through um, uh, palm oil and timber extraction and farming soya, which feeds your meat animals. So if you're a meat eater, then this is partly to do with you. Um, then there's sea level rise. As the oceans warm up, they expand. And as ice melts off land, uh, the sea level rises. And uh, this is going to flood London and New York and Miami and Bangladesh and Kiribati. And it's going to make large areas of the world uninhabitable over the next few decades. Um, it's a bit of a problem, really. We're, we're a messy lot. This poor albatross chick was uh, mistakenly fed plastic waste 
by its parent and it has died because we throw so much rubbish into the ocean. Another problem with the oceans is fish stocks. We're overfishing uh, unsustainable fisheries. Fisheries have started to crash and uh, that means that a lot of people who uh, rely on fish for their sustenance are not going to have any fish by about 2048. There'll be no commercial fish stocks left in the sea if the line continues going down. And another problem is pollinators. You can see all the issues to do with pollinators. And uh, invasive species, I couldn't find a graph for that. And here's um, what's happening to our aquifers. We're using up water at an unsustainable rate. We also pollute surface water with uh, nitrates from fertilizers. And this is, on, in some occasions, causing toxic algal blooms that also kill fish. Climate change is going to give us floods. We know about that. But, well, not floods, not, not that look like that, but look more like that. Floods are very, very destructive things. Um, another destructive thing, heat waves. People die from heat waves. Um, and and the changing patterns of, of temperature are going to do changing patterns of disease, not just human disease, but animal diseases as well. All these are measured in and the, this graph of measures of the Anthropocene. Anthropocene is a word they've invented for... Um, the new epoch that we're in with the way that we have changed things. And I was actually searching for this because there's a line there starting at 1900, which is species extinctions. I couldn't find a graph just of that, but this popped up. Um, now, the um, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change is the mechanism that we are um, engaged in to try and reduce our carbon footprint and the eventual uh, temperature. We're looking forward to 2100 as a, a benchmark and if we continue emitting as we do now we'll go up to more than 4.5 degrees C above baseline and the idea is to keep it to below two uh, with the um, in, um, intended nationally determined contributions it will go up to plus 3.5 not not less than two it's plus 3.5 so we need to still do much much better than the uh, COP21 summit um, and uh, this, this, is, this is bad. Now, let's just talk about 2 degrees, 4 degrees, 6 degrees. The IPCC is talking about 2 degrees because 2 degrees is a disaster. We don't want to live in a plus 2 world. It, it's, it's going to be a very, very different world to where we are now. Plus 4 is the end of civilization. This is no, our human civilization, as we know, would not survive 4 degrees by 2100. And plus 6 is human extinction. Okay. Now, most of the graphs that you saw are, are fairly nice, smooth lines going up. There is the possibility that there could be some abrupt climate changes. This happened in the past on at least three occasions. I mean, very abrupt climate changes of uh, six degrees and more within just a few decades. These could be precipitated with um, the um, tipping points with reflectivity in the Arctic and uh, permafrost, the permafrost melting with methane emissions. So um, the, the future is looking grim. Uh, this evidence does not fill me with positivity at all. However, although I believe that human beings are going to go extinct, there are, there are a couple of reasons for kind of positivity. Uh, firstly, well, I'm always looking for evidence that I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong about climate change. I'd love to be wrong about where humans are going. But I, I, do, I do get some glimmers of positivity, and I, I hold on to these to keep my lifestyle going. Firstly, life is amazing. We are alive. I, you're all alive. That's amazing. Life is, as far as we know, only in one place in the universe, and that's on this planet. Make the most of it. Your life is short. If you ask any senior citizen about how quickly their life has gone, they'll say it's gone very quickly. So anybody that's young here, really enjoy your life because you'll be old very soon. The other, the other reason is that we, we could be wrong about this stuff. We could be wrong about climate change, maybe. We, we could be wrong about human extinction. And let's say that we are. Well, let's say that in, in a few thousand years there are human beings still living on the planet. Then it's really important you live low carbon to give them that choice, that, that chance to do that. So your choice to be low carbon and to think about your diet and your travel means that people could be living on this planet in thousands of years to come. The other thing is that humans are not necessarily the pinnacle of evolution. Okay? 
if, if we go extinct, and all species do go extinct eventually, um, then I want to leave a planet that allows other living things the best possibility of existing and having this amazing, unique life on this planet. So that's why I'm green, and that's how I do green, and I have a great life being green. So I, I want you to consider being lower carbon than you are now, and every year trying going lower carbon, because your quality of life does not deteriorate. It'll get better as you feel you're doing the right thing. So that's my story, and I think I'll finish with that. Thank you.